camera and a, and a big lens who could throw the background out of focus and make girls look beautiful, you know, and that was almost as good as owning a guitar and being able to play it. And then after that, when I was working with the cooperative, it was more a question of trying to reflect something of the person I was interviewing mm -hmm. or the article that I was writing. It was much more of a documentary bent. So things change over time. And uh, the recent exhibition with Michael Eldridge, the return to really exploring the sort of power of, of nature and the ability of nature to be able to heal and to release people from the sort of everyday tyranny of time that, uh, that, that most people find themselves under, particularly since the cell phones come into being and, uh, you know, it keeps going off and making people work 24 hours the same. a day. All those years uh, in photography, for well, you. magic. Huh? It's magic. Uh -huh. it, 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 you know, it doesn't matter how, what technical explanations you have as you know, this chemicals working on this paper or this uh, fixative is being used in order to you know create this grain or this is a digital medium and you know the, the actual. Um, I don't really want to use the word capture, but you know, the actual ability to take a moment in time and to represent it in some form, often today on a computer screen, but you know, I, I still like paper prints best. Uh, it's just magic as far as I'm concerned. And how does magic relate to psychoanalysis? Uh, well, I think magic relates to psychoanalysis in the sense that uh, you know, as children, we we tend to think in terms in magical ways. Um, you know, there's been a lot written about that, although I don't cover it in the book. But you know, there is this period of time when children go through what they call magical thinking. You know, they think that they they think something and it happens, and then they feel responsible for it. That can be very good or very bad, depending what's happened. So. Uh, somebody has an angry thought about their brother, for example, and he falls out of a tree and breaks his arm, there is a period in time when the person will actually feel that they've caused it in some way. And of course, in traditional societies, uh, there are people that really take advantage of this. I mean, there are various different shamans and witch doctors and so on. And as you know, in family therapy as well, there's the whole question of ritual. Um, I know when I was working at Maudsley, there was somebody that had a sort of very negative association with their previous psychiatrist, in fact. You know, and I said to them, well, you know, sometimes people do a kind of a, a ritual. They think about the person, perhaps they perhaps they draw a picture of them, you know, and screw the piece of paper up and throw it in the bin, you know, and the following week the person came back and said, well, we've dealt with it, you know, we've, thank you, we've solved the problem with this psychiatrist that gave us all this awful advice. And I said, oh, really? And they said, yes, they said, we wrote his name down, very small, on a sheet of A4 paper, and then we went to the library and we photocopied it 50 times. And then we cut the name up into little strips. And then we boiled the strips, we fried them in uh, the chip fryer until they were black. And then we took the content of the chip fryer out and we, we, we put it in a pot where there was some earth. And we buried it in the earth of the flower pot. And then we took it down the municipal dump and threw it away. You know, that's magical thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so even in terms of adulthood, there, there's something about magical thinking that also stays with us and has the ability to both damage and to heal, depending upon how you use it. Mm -hmm. And I think in photography, it has the ability to heal um, if it's approached sensibly, but equally it's neutral. I mean, it's a bit like it's a bit like the X-ray machine, in a sense, the X-ray machine is a camera. Um, you get too many X-rays, you damage the tissue, but you can use it in order to diagnose and to heal. So, um, who's the magic for? Because if you're looking at the camera, there are uh, two people, one who's posing or 
before the camera and the other one is the one behind the camera. Mm. Who is this the man? I mean, and, the, and as you mentioned in your talk, then there's the third object, which is the camera itself. Mm. Mm. Uh, who is the magic for? I mean, uh, well, I don't think the magic's for the camera. I mean, the camera is an extension of some sort of consciousness, I think. <laughs> but I do think people actually project different things onto the camera. They see it as something that can be potentially intrusive. You know, when you see people walk through shopping centers or these cameras in the streets, I guess people are used to them now. But, you know, in the old days, you used to see people looking around, even if they hadn't done anything wrong, mm -hmm. um, because they felt some sort of intrusion simply because of the machine. But it's not the machine, it's what's behind the machine that really they mm -hmm. weren't concerned about. And what they think is behind the machine, of course, because it's all... I mean, I would really like to come back to this issue. Uh, but mm. before that, and uh, you, you worked as a systemic therapist. Yeah. Uh, as a systemic family therapist. Yeah, and it was funny, actually, because... Our office was situated below the Department of Psychotherapy that did psychoanalytical dynamic therapy. And we used to get sent the people that um, either had failed or were considered unsuitable for dynamic therapy. So that was quite, that was quite interesting. And for me, the interesting part is that actually, uh, how come, I mean, I mean, you're back to psychoanalysis. I mean, why did you choose uh, to uh, relate photography to with psychoanalysis? So All the first generation of family therapists knew about psychoanalysis. I mean, Palazzoli knew about psychotherapy. All of her team, Luigi Boscolo, Kachin, they all knew. Family therapy actually evolved out of, sort of psychoanalytical ideas. So it was there within systemic therapy, although it was actually sort of seen as something rather that should be shunned or, or denied or, or, or um, uh, otherwise ignored. Um, and, you know, like that first generation of people, when I was originally training, before I trained as a family therapist, then I trained in something called psychodynamic casework, which involved going to see a tutor once or twice a week. And they would say things like, well, you know, you're on this placement now. How does that make you feel? So there was a lot of kind of analytical technique within that. So in that sense, I knew quite a lot about psychoanalysis beforehand. But the second reason is because both photography and psychoanalysis have matured at the same time. Um, and although there's been an influence of systemic ideas within photography over the past sort of 50 years, um, it would be true to say that there's been that sort of influence within psychoanalysis over the past 50 years as well, you know, with the ideas of sort of intersubjective psychoanalysis, for example. So it, it made sense to go to ideas about defense mechanisms and projections and those kind of things. The, the idea that in psychoanalysis one is looking to bring into the light of consciousness material and within photography one is seeking to use light in order to create some sort of new view or new reality um, that wasn't so evident before. So really, those, that, that's the basic reason why I chose psychoanalysis rather than systems theory, although we do get into systemic ideas within the book. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the common thing about light and consciousness? I mean, you said that uh, bringing thing, a new thing or a new perspective into light, uh, yes. uh, this is one of the things that photography is trying mm. to achieve, actually. Mm and that you relate it with the, with the exploration of unconsciousness mm. in psychoanalysis. Mm. Uh, so, what do we do when we, are, when we take a photograph, you think? I mean, what are we really doing? Well, I mean, I think Cartier Bresson put it at its best. You know, a good photograph is when the two worlds collide, you know, the outer world. Of, um, the scene of whatever is occurring in the inner psychological world of the person and the two things come together and they're expressed in this artifact which we call a photograph 
And in some way, that artifact has the capability of being able to transmit the original experience in some form to